Welcome to this lecture on post-structuralist literary criticism. This is NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We are in module 4 of our series of lectures, um, collectively entitled English Language and Literature. Module 4, as you know, is devoted to literary criticism. Um, the last lecture was devoted to structuralism and structuralist literary criticism and today's lecture is on post-structuralism. There are obviously several texts that you may want to consult as far as post-structuralism in general and post-structuralist literary criticism in particular are concerned. However, for beginners, I would recommend a useful book, Beginning Theory by Peter Barry. You may also look up particularly for deconstruction, Barbara Johnson's well-known book, The Critical Difference. As with other lectures, I shall be taking extracts and referring to uh, a couple of other texts as well in a bit to explain what post-structuralist criticism is all about. Well, let us begin um, before talking about the relation between post-structuralism and structuralism. Let us begin by looking at what Chris Barker in his Sage Handbook of Cultural, Stud uh, Cultural Studies um, says about post-structuralism and let me read from him. The prefix post clearly suggests after, thus post-structuralism is after structuralism in that the terms of this philosophical stream are ones that involve both the absorption of key ideas from structuralism and a critique and transformation of them, right. So, post is not simply um, you know a temporal prefix, right. Post here means that well we only take off or you know um, take off from structuralism, right, retaining some of its key ideas and at the same time critiquing those ideas and attempting to transform them as we shall see in a while. Now, from a philosophical point of view as uh, one critic has mentioned here, uh, post-structuralism looks at knowledge and problematizes it. Knowledge is not a question of true discovery, but of the construction of interpretations okay, about the world that are taken to be true. In so far as the idea of truth has an historical purchase, it is the consequence of power that is of whose interpretations come to count as truth. Right? So, um, the two you know um, the two important important words here are A interpretation and B power, right. Post structuralism like post enlightenment thinking uh, for instance post modernism does not believe in what we call truth with a capital T, right. Post structuralism says that there are many perhaps innumerable interpretations that one may give or one may bear upon a particular text. Okay. These interpretations are to use a word a common word in post structuralism are slippery. Okay. They are not about you know the true discovery of what a literary text is about. Okay. Post structuralism says that in this variety or in these if you, I may use the word in, the, in these plethora of interpretations okay those interpretations have you know uh, a ring of truth about them or are or are considered to be true interpretations uh, which have 
to do with power. Okay? It says here that it is as a consequence, right? as a consequence of power that interpretations come to be true. Right? For example, it is not that it happens only in post structuralism. For instance, if you go back and look at a, uh, the criticism that was there before or prior to feminist literary criticism. Okay? Uh, those criticisms or the, those critical uh, way, uh, ways of critical analysis or critical tools right, counted as true. Okay? When we had feminism as a critical methodology, we found that feminism gave a different interpretation of the text and challenged the you know the hegemonic and masculinist way of reading text okay where there is an erasure of the woman right so we move on and we then understand that post structuralism has to do of course with interpretation language games and power it is well within the linguistic turn uh, that was inaugurated by structuralism okay, and understands ways of talking, understands interpretations, discussions and analysis as, as language games. Right? And you know that uh, you know, language games is a term that comes from the philosopher Wittgenstein. Okay? So, there are ways of talking. For instance, to put it very simply, uh, there are ways in which we talk when we are in a certain scenario. Right. For instance, when we are talking, uh, you know, to our seniors, there is a way in which we speak. When we talk, when we go to a restaurant and when we order, uh, you know, a meal, there is a certain, it's a different way in which we speak. Okay. So instead of talking about truths, then Wittgenstein said, talked about language games. There are different ways of of talking in language. So, post structuralism also falls within this kind of or this within this orientation of thinking, laying more Im importance not on one way of reading a text, but on interpretation, language games, and power. So, uh, when we if we quickly go back to our lecture on structuralism, we had found in the last lecture that within structuralism, meaning is always differential and relational. Right? Uh, post structuralism also shares these aspects of meaning, meaning being differential in a system, okay? uh, meaning being uh, meaning emanating in, a, you know, um, uh, in relation to other units in the system. However, there is a difference. Remember, we had said right in the beginning that post structuralism critiques is not only after coming after structuralism and retaining some of some structuralism's core concepts, but also it is a critique and a transformation of those concepts. Right? Uh, in structuralism, we saw that meaning was basically uh, an, uh, an outcome of the organization of science, okay? and there was a certain stability. Right? These structures in structuralism gave us certain stability of meaning. Okay? Now, if you talk about the revision, uh, the reorientation or the, you know, the uh, transformation that is brought about by post structuralism, then this is where we must first look at. Okay? Stability through structures. Post structuralism um, critiques radically the very stability of the structure that is celebrated, so to speak, by structuralism. Okay. Uh, in a way, we may say that post structuralism questions right, the structurality of the structure. You follow? What did we find in structuralism? That uh, we can have a, you know, meaning in a text, we can have meaning in a text by looking at the differential relation, okay, relationship between or among words or among different units of a text. Okay. Uh, there are certain codes for instance, given the five codes given by Rolla Bart. Um, there are certain codes by which meaning can be teased out from a text okay? and the text is a structure which is more or less stable. Right? In post structuralism, particularly through the work of the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, we will find that the stability is an illusion. 
okay, replaced by another word which is the slipperiness of the text. Right? So, from this is the core the radical break uh, as far as um, structuralism is concerned when we talk about post structuralism. Therefore, we may say that in post structuralism whereas, in structuralism that is meaning is arrived at okay, meaning is possible by looking at the structure and studying the text through codes. In post structuralism we find that the meaning of a text is endlessly deferred this is the word to defer or we may say to postpone the meaning of a text is always postponed right. Why this is what we need to understand now if you understand why it is considered in post structuralism that meaning is you know forever postponed then you would have understood one of the core claims of post structuralism. Okay. Here we have a very important word given to us by Jacques Derrida that is difference right. This is a word that collapses two words to differ and to defer. Okay. The, the differing part we have already found in, in structuralism. But Derrida adds another component to this difference which it to, uh, together calls difference that is to defer that is again as I said in the previous slide through the previous slide the postponing of meaning. Now, uh, we, uh, what we will do is we will quickly look at another um, uh, insight given to us and this is by Pramod K. Nair in his um, uh, useful book An Introduction to Cultural Studies. Let us read and, and I shall explain this. Nair says that thus reading or interpretation is the movement through the chain of signs seeking a temporary meaning from or at each halt. Right? Even if there is a feeling of having arrived at a meaning in po post structuralism we have to admit or post structuralism needs us to admit that there is only a temporary closure of meaning of the text okay the uh, uh, you know uh, because of the slipperiness of the sign which i shall come to in a while because of the slipperiness of the sign uh, meaning is is uh, you know meaning is is uh, very temporary and in the next instance the meaning is gone or the meaning is deferred okay to have another meaning come up so then he says this suggests that every signifier that is a word or a sign leads not to a stable end signified, but to more signifiers. Now, what did we see in structuralism? In structuralism we saw that for instance these letters T, R, E and E or the syllable tree right brings to our mind the concept right the concept of the concept of tree not a real tree, but the co uh, concept or the psychological impression as Ferdinand de Saussure would call it the psychological impression of tree. We also agreed that a tree may mean different things in different circumstances. For instance, if you are doing a tree diagram sitting underneath a tree, the tree diagram in your laptop and I come along and say that that is that is a beautiful tree. Okay. So, there is an ambiguity here. The tree may refer to the tree under which you are, or you are sitting or it may refer to the tree diagram. right? So, meaning is, is slippery even in structuralism, but structuralism held that you know there is difference in context all right, but one would eventually understand that the tree is referred to here is either of this. Okay? In post structuralism however, it is a little different. Since meaning comes about, right, uh, owing to a, uh, you know a system of difference, okay, it not only differs but the meaning is also deferred. Why? Because every signifier, right, carries this is the word carries echoes from other signifiers, okay, so that meaning is never arrived at in complete totality or complete certainty. Do you follow? Okay. So, this suggests as Pramod K. Nair says, this suggests that every signifier 
that is word or sign leads not to a stable end signified, but to more signifiers. This implies that meaning is never fully graspable and the final meaning is always postponed or as we saw a while ago deferred, right? because words carry the echoes of other words leading to an, a final ambiguity. Okay? So, this is also called what Derrida calls the aporia, right? the, uh, that the impossible impossibility of any meaning for that matter that is that is called the slippery uh, slipperiness of language right derrida also uses a very important phrase which he says where he says that there are in language there are no pure signifieds right the signifier signified which we found was very neatly drawn out in post -struct in structuralism sorry by ferdinand de saussure what happens here is the signified can never be known in its totality Okay, because there are always, uh, you know, uh, because the sign is always under erasure, right? Under erasure by its, uh, the fact that it is in a relation, it, it is in relation with other terms in the system. Fine. Therefore, these are non-essentialist and non-ontological categories. Uh, and finally, we understand that language is socially constructed and language is never to be fully grasped. Therefore, we can look at a text as a play of signifiers, not allowing any stable meaning. Now, I hope you have understood this. Okay? Uh, text is seen as a play of signifiers and if you look at this slide here, there are no, in language there are no pure or stable signifieds. Okay? So, if you have a term, a signifier and you feel that you have understood what it signifies. Derrida and other post structuralists would say that no, there is no stability in the sex signified, okay, because it is always and it is already uh, too meshed in with other terms in the system. In that sense, a text also is open to innumerable uh, interpretations of words. Now, let me put a caveat here. This is in, I mean, in no way is Derrida saying that there should be an irresponsible play of meaning in a text that uh, nor, nor is he saying that you know you can do do anything with the text and you can do any give any you know ridiculous interpretation of a text what he is asking us to understand is the very nature of language itself right he says that language by its very nature is not stable right uh, there is always or uh, if i may use a word a contamination so to speak okay with by other words in the system. Do you understand? So, in a way if you look at it, a, uh, you know we do not have to deconstruct a text because of the nature of the relation between the signifier and signified in post structuralism vis a vis structuralism, we find that meaning is not at all possible in the first place. Okay? So, lang the text really is already deconstructed. Okay? You do not have to perform deconstruction on the text, the text comes to you. Okay, incomplete. The text comes to you, uh, you know, uh, amenable to several and different interpretations. So we are not to say that this interpretation is correct. If somebody says that this interpretation or, or a particular interpretation is correct, then that is, according to post-structuralists, an act of power, an act of hegemony, an act of trying to pin down the text when actually there are so many other interpretations available. Remember this. The detractors of post structuralism would always uh, or mostly think that you know what Derrida has done is played a sort of dirty trick on us, right? Uh, the a kind of trick that a charlatan would do. In fact, charlatan is a word that is used against, has been used against Derrida. But the point is what he is he's saying here is you know what he calls the metaphysics of presence. He says that the entire Western philosophy is sort of you know, if you have to use the word. Um, plagued by the metaphysics of presence. Okay? The, um, uh, the um, uh, how should I say it, uh, the privileging, right? we saw binary oppositions in the last lecture. He says the privileging of one part of the binary opposition over another. Let us say man, woman, okay? culture, nature, right? um, strength, weakness. Um, 
light and darkness okay there's always a privileging of one side okay of the binary scheme right and that is why he says that uh, this is uh, you know this is a way of thinking in western philosophy that has to be deconstructed okay and language by itself shows that it is already slippery and uh, not graspable in its totality therefore we may use terms like deferral substitution and supplementation we won't go into this because there's a lot more to be talked about therefore a text now look at this slide here text is therefore always any text for the matter not just a literary text a text is therefore always unstable and forever recreated you may create recreate the meaning of a text there was a recreation or there is a recreation of hamlet when you for instance when you talk from a feminist point that too is a recreation okay from a from a uh, feminist point of view okay when you talk about gertrude when you foreground gertrude and ophelia uh, and not hamlet and horatio or hamlet senior uh, uh, or even claudius right so in that sense there's already uh, uh, you know foregrounding of the other part of the, bi of the of the binary right of male and female characters okay that also is now therefore you can have a hybrid way of you know a hybrid methodology say deconstruction is or feminist deconstruction is me methodology okay uh, so the text therefore is forever recreated right by again as i said by refusing to accept the fact that a signifier means or can come to a uh, can refer to a totally or fully graspable meaning in its signified because of this gap between the signifier and the signified there's enormous even political potential right in deconstructionist uh, deconstructionist uh, methodology to to intervene in accepted and established power saturated meanings of texts therefore interpretation which we saw was a core concept in post structuralism interpretation is therefore shifting and interpretation is contingent interpretation is contingent upon uh, circumstances it is contingent upon uh, political orientations political views okay so you may create different interpretations and meanings of a particular text depending on the contingent situation that you are in this is i would say this is a tremendously liberating way of doing literary criticism okay and uh, perhaps those who um, uh, you know those who are quite radical detractors of post structuralism uh, it could be as nayar says in one of his books okay pramod nayar says in one of his books that probably uh, you are you are scared of losing authority okay when you have different meanings okay or meanings that are different from your interpretation clamoring for attention and establishing a different reading of a text right this is similar to what uh, you know you find in michel foucault another post structuralist okay when he says that meaning is always regulated by power right meaning is not to be seen in terms of a chain of eternal deferrals only okay according to foucault now here if you look at this according to foucault there is no point in you know finding innumerable meanings in a text he says well what's the point of you know um, it, then it becomes a, actually play you know in that sense of a, like a game for you know for michel foucault he says there is no point in only substituting one meaning with another meaning right he says it's most important he says he do this but it's most important again to show how these different meanings come from different sources of power or the absence of power do you understand there in uh foucault gives us a caution uh, you know a note of caution sorry a note of caution that there is no point in uh, you know in playing a game of how many different meanings i can find out from a text the job is a or you know um uh, in a more important a more significant one that is of finding out how you know uh, meaning is always regulated by power by systems of power in society okay now quickly if we uh, you know look at the attitude of post structuralism and structuralism towards language 
and uh, you'll, uh, I think this is from Peter Berry, I've taken it from Peter Berry, Berry's book. The attitude to language in structuralism is this. Structuralists think that the world is constructed through language and that we do not have access to reality other than through the linguistic medium. You, uh, you remember from our last lecture that structuralism says that uh, language constructs reality. Language is the only way through which we can apprehend reality and there are obviously chances that we can never apprehend the whole of reality. Why? Because it comes to us through the linguistic medium. Right? Post structuralism, the post structuralists assert that they do not have full control over the medium of language. Linguistic anxiety, this is a very nice way of putting it. Um, linguistic anxiety is the keynote of post structuralism. Now, look at this again. Okay? Um, we do not have access to reality, says the post, uh, you know, say the post structuralists. We do not have access to reality except through language. Okay? So, um, fine we may not know what reality is in its totality, but at least we know that we have created a reality for us based on language, okay, which is structured, a system that is structured, okay, where meaning emanates from uh, the, a differential relationship between the units or I'm sorry among the units. Okay. But you see how this break is made as when we come to post structuralism. Post structuralism also says that yes, our understanding of reality is largely the work of language, okay? but they add this very important point here, which is that this very language that we talk about is something that is the something over which we do not have control. Even if we human beings have made language, even if we have constructed language, we have no control over the language. Now, why? Recall what I have said just a while ago that is because of the very nature of language. Okay? The very fact as Zarida argues that there is, there can never be any pure signifies. Okay, because it is already, you know, it is because the meaning of any term comes about only in relationship to other terms, how can we have a pure signified, okay, pure impure in the sense that it does not have an, look at this, this is most important, it does not have an ontological meaning about it. Do you follow? The meaning of chair is or the word chair gives us a meaning or psychological impression of chair, not because there is something chairish about a chair. Okay? Uh, but because it is different from other objects of furniture. right? So, uh, do you follow this? Theref therefore, post structuralists would say that yes, we un understand the, you know, it when the structuralists tell us that reality is apprehendable only through language, but let us remind ourselves that this very medium is a problematic one. Okay? So, the word, the term linguistic anxiety. Fine. So, there is, a, there is an anxiety even as you are using language, there is a, always this anxiety and high suspicion that you can never, that, that the meaning of a word or meaning of a sentence and even of a text is never to be the final one. Okay? It is forever uh, in, in a state of deference, that is it is forever deferring and it is forever deferred. I hope you have understood this. Okay? Linguistic anxiety is the keynote of post structuralism. So, we again now look at um, what the critic Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak uh, talks about when she says that a word is always under erasure right? uh, from this French um, a French phrase which means under erasure to write a word, cross it out and then print both word and deletion. For instance, you write print both word. So, you, you write print both word and, de and deletion, you write this at the same time you have a, you have marked it. So, this means that you have written it, but you know bec that because you know you are trying to, trying to show you are trying to demonstrate that you understand that these words print both word and deletion, 
do not have any do not have their corresponding pure signifies and even as a string of words it may not have a or it does not have rather a pure signified or a constant meaning okay so to write the word cross it out and then print both word and deletion this part that we have you know um, uh, uh, we have struck out it simply uh, you know means or it is as i said an attempt to show that i am using words but i know that these words are under erasure or i know that their meanings are always deferred so this is uh, you know um, way of showing uh, you know um, and the showing that words do not have complete or full meanings okay so since the word is inaccurate right it is crossed out and since it is necessary it remains legible so you have the words there at the same time you cross it out or you cross the words out to show that they are necessary and at the same time they are inaccurate do you understand it's not to say that every time we write we are going to also cross out the words and keep them under erasure just to show that look i am saying this but i know that my words do not convey uh, you know or they are always under erasure this is one way of just to show uh, you know so perhaps in a pictorial way okay uh, what exactly is meant by this deferral of meaning or the erasure or meaning being under erasure right so i referred to barbara johnson's the critical difference and i'll quickly read uh, from her in order to enrich what we are talking about in the critical difference published in 1981 barbara johnson says that the term uh, deconstruction denotes a particular kind of practice okay it's a kind of practice in reading and thereby a method of criticism and mode of analytical inquiry many would say that deconstructive criticism is no crit criticism how can it be a crit uh, you know uh, a critical methodology when it itself talks about the deferral of meaning so deconstructive crit a deconstructive critical uh, uh, critical piece uh, by itself is uh, a failure because deconstruction says that well no meaning is final now that is i would say is taking it to uh, you know uh, quite is illogical um, you know illogical uh, extreme in the sense that uh, deconstruction doesn't say that because language is slippery because there is linguistic anxiety that we should stop talking at all right it knows that language is the only medium as structuralists do but it also cautions us that that medium is fraught with the lack of final meaning it's it so it, it's pointless really it's rather uh, you know what we call arguing uh, uh, you know ad infinitum or uh, arguing um, even uh, what was that term uh, arguing uh, uh, in you know in um, complete absurdity okay uh, that the deconstructionists should not say anything about a text because after all they say that well um words have no meaning okay that is not our point here a point is to understand that the deconstructionist will show you a different way a different say a different philosophical stance altogether okay so therefore johnson rightly says that well deconstruction is a kind of critical practice it is a method she even goes on to call it a method of criticism okay and a mode of analytical inquiry right so there is no reason to just throw the baby out with the bath water and to say that well deconstructionists have no place they are saying something and as critics like johnson and spivak say we ought to listen so let's read on the term uh, sorry deconstruction is not synonymous with destruction very beautifully put they do not the deconstructionists do not destroy post structuralism they not does not destroy the text okay so we have to understand to deconstruct is not a negative activity please understand this to deconstruct is not a destructive ability right or a destructive uh, uh, tool right so deconstruction is more like dismantling you know when you dismantle something uh, you do not destroy it right you can put it back together okay so deconstruction is not synonymous with destruction however it is in fact much closer to the original meaning of the word analysis 
which etymol etymol uh, etymologically means to undo. So, we have to understand deconstruction in terms of undoing a text. Remember, I said in terms of dismantling. So, dismantling, undoing is not the same as destruction, which etymologically means to undo, a virtual synonym for to deconstruct. If anything is destroyed in a deconstructive reading, says Johnson, it is not the text. This is very important and I think she's put it so beautifully. If anything is destroyed at all, then it is certainly not the text, but the claim to unequivocal domination of one mode of signifying over another. Okay? So, she says deconstruction destroys the myth, destroys the illusion that there is only one dominant way of looking at a text or one dominant mode of signifying right a word signifies and to the words together that is a text a text also signifies so if you say the text a means meaning a then we have to understand that that, that behind that is uh, or rather that itself that pronouncement is an act of power right an act of hegemony you are trying to sort of impose your meaning your signification of a, a text okay, uh, over all others. So, if anything is destroyed in a deconstructive reading it is not the text, but the claim of claim to unequivocal domination of the mode of signifying over of one mode of signifying over another. A deconstructive reading is a reading which analyzes the specificity of a text critical difference from not other texts from itself. So, beautifully put I you know we should say that a deconstructive reading analyzes a text critical difference or you could say a text uh, critical distance from its own self. Okay? That what it is purporting according to you according to the reader. Okay? Because if there is no reader there is no text in that sense in deconstructive criticism. Um, what what a, a deconstructive reading does is to show that what meaning is purported to come from a text. Okay, there is always a gap. Why? There is a gap because the words do not have pure signifies or pure reference. Do you follow? Okay. Um, Jonathan Color, another critic has this to say deconstruction if it is of any consequence is not reducible to a specialized set of discursive procedures right it is a method all right but you cannot say that this is there is one way or set of procedures uh, a set of tools that you can use while certainly deconstruction is not anti methodological neither could be called a discourse on method as such Okay. Derrida says it is also at the very least a way of taking a position in its work of analysis concerning the political and institutional structures that make possible and govern our practices, our competencies and our performances. Remember, if somebody tells you that this is just a linguistic turn okay, and that you are in what is famously called the prison house of language. Remember that deconstruction and other schools, other methods in post structuralism uh, also has a clearly political angle to it. Okay? As critics like Derrida would argue that deconstruction is not just clinical method of showing how meaning disappears or showing you know how there are no pure signifies or that the text destroys itself or deconstructs itself or that the text is already deconstructed. That is one part of the philosophical explanation or philosophical uh, you know uh, orientation of deconstruction. The other is clearly political okay? and deconstruction seeks to show us that any stable meaning or any uh, you know uh, any demand or sorry claim over uh, 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 over one uh, you know meaning or set of meanings is always an act of power. So, it is also a way of taking a position on a text okay, which he called reading against the grain of the text, reading against the texture of a text, reading against the obvious conventional so to speak 
or, or uh, uh, um, spontaneous meaning of a text. We believe in reconstruction that we are trained to read in a certain way okay? and our culture, our cultural you know, assumptions and biases also kind of give uh, make us do spontaneous readings of a text uh, by eliciting certain signifiers for a signifier. What Derrida says is read against the text, deconstruct it in a bit to show how, how it has been constructed by language and how it cannot reach uh, one particular meaning. So, uh, therefore, it is also as it says here concerned with the political and institutional structures that make possible and govern our practices. These govern our practices, our competencies and our performances. Even our performances on a text, okay, even the analysis you do on a text are tied to our practices within certain institutional power based structures, political structures that make us uh, you know uh, seemingly or give us seemingly spontaneous which we feel are correct responses to a text. Okay? So, these are some uh, I would think some of the uh, cautionary uh, uh, points of caution that uh, post structuralism very rightly gives us. Then as I said um, about how a text is already dismantled, this comes from Hillis Miller and where he says that deconstruction is not a dismantling of the structure of a text, but the demonstration that it has already dismantled itself, right? where formalism seeks to, to demonstrate that a work has essential unity because, or oh sorry, despite the paradoxes and irony that create its inner tension, deconstruction seeks to show that a text has no organic unity or basis for presenting meanings only as it says here a series of conflicting significations. This is very important. Okay? Formalism also belongs to a particular way of looking at a text. Okay? A new criticism also belongs to that, you know, that way of looking at the text looking at the words on the text. Okay? How is deconstruction different? Deconstruction is different according to Hill, uh, uh, J. Hillis Miller that it refuses a totality, it refuses an organic unity to the text and it says that there are only conflicting significations of a text and that the, f uh, the fact that the text is already sort of um, you know already impure in that sense and sense of pure meanings not having pure meanings, uh, view the very act of reading has to show the conflicting interpretations or, or the con conflicting signification in a text. That is essentially the job of or you could say the method of uh, a deconstructive critic okay? to show the conflicting signifieds or the conflicting processes of signification in a text and to deny the text a single meaning. Therefore, deconstruction as has been shown is not really a form of critique according to some, it, according to others, it is not a method, it is not a theory, it is not a discourse or an operation. Uh, it is, it is a, a reiteration, okay? it is a reiteration of the fact that the text is already dismantled, that the text is already deconstructed. So, um, there, therefore, you know it goes against what Derrida calls the logocentrism or the metaphysics of presence in western philosophy and it says that there is no logos or there is no core or essence or truth, right? there is no center. The moment you have a center or a core or an essence or a truth, you know we end up privileging one reading over the other. Because if you have a core then you always, al al always have something on the margins, okay, something in the periphery. Right? So, any act of saying that this is the core of a text, this is the essence of a text is an act of power and it betrays the logocentrism on or what he calls the metaphysics of presence in the reader right? and there are no transcendental or pure signifieds. Now, I will quickly end by referring to the reading of by Christopher Prendergast of uh, Derrida's Hamlet. Okay? Now, 
here he says that for someone like Derrida, the significance of the ghost of Hamlet's father uh, resides in his radical indeterminacy. If you, uh, what is the, the, what are the opening words of Shakespeare's Hamlet, where we have um, the guard saying, "Who's there?" And many have taken this as a cue to forming a deconstructive reading. Okay, "Who's there?" is talks about uh, in in one sense. Okay, the indeterminacy of, you know, it is not just a guard saying who is there, right. So, it, in, it symbolizes the indeterminacy of or the impossibility of knowing or not uh, or, or the fact that you do not know who is there, right. So, this also is attached to the figure of the ghost of Hamlet's father, right. For Derrida, the significance of the ghost rides in its, resides in its radical indeterminacy. You know that Hamlet is also not sure whether it is, uh, you know, a, a hallucination or whether uh, whether it's an evil spirit uh, that has conjured the of the um, ghost of his father, uh, you know, um, which then who then exhorts uh, him to take revenge. Okay, uh, Inspectors of Marx by Derrida uh, says Christopher Prendergast, it is indeterminate in the more strictly ontological register of occupying a place, non-place between presence and absence, appearance and disappearance. So, the you know really the, the ghost of Hamlet's father by its very uh, nature okay, of being and not being right in the scene of you know uh, being of inhabiting a place between which is between midway between presence and absence between appearance and disappearance on residing in a you know somewhere between a place and a non place right. So, he says that in this you know it is symbolic of what the deconstructionist is trying to say that words too also occupy this non space and that is why its signification can never be finally grasped. The spectre let us read on the spectre is a thing and yet not a thing not a substance. It hover, hovers uncertainly between material embodiment and disembodiment, it inhabits a place of pure virtuality and what in that space is swallowed up is the ontological ground of being itself. Okay. So, the most important word here is that post structuralism in general does away with ontology or essences, right. There are no essences in, in uh, post structuralism. Okay all that we can have are really traces is another word here. We can have traces, we can have supplements, but we cannot have the word literally cannot have the word in its you know you cannot have the word in its totality okay, which because the word meaning therefore, is always slippery and it escapes our grasp that is the very nature of language. Then uh, Niall, uh, near Lucy and we carry this on, on Nia Lucy says here, I am using uh, Ham, uh, the, you know Shakespeare's play and uh, you know talking about how a few critics have talked about uh, you know Shakespeare's play in that uh, in to show more light on how we can symbolically connect it to, to uh, deconstruction. Who is there? This is what we referred to a while ago. Who is there? The opening uh, words is not a question we would ask ever ask of something like hydrogen. But it is the question that Bernardo asks uh, at the very beginning of Shakespeare's Hamlet and, and we might say that this question which opens the play remains open still at the end. In Hamlet, the question of who or what is there. The ghost in Hamlet would could be said to pose the question, who am I, when am I, what is my being, what is my time. For Derrida, these cannot be confined to effects upon the characters and events in that text itself. Okay. They extend rather to questions of being and time in general and this is a philosophical aspect of post structuralism. We do not have much time here, I, I would have uh, liked to you know talk uh, to deconstruct or show uh, you know the deconstructed nature of the text by using a poem like we did in structuralism, but I hope I have been able to at least um, tell you or convey to you some of the important, important points in uh, post structuralism there is no point really in saying that deconstruction uh, there is no you know deconstruction can never be a method uh, because uh, it already says that language is impure then that we can never mean anything that is not the point that is really arguing as I said ad absurdum 
right. The point here is that we have we understand we do use language, but at the same time we have to understand that language is uh, uh, by its very nature because you know uh, uh, a term is part of a system. Okay, is not there is no nothing ontological about it. It's always relational. Okay, we have to understand that language is deficient in that sense of um, where you know or, or where the, uh, the 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 delineating of a full meaning is concerned. That is what deconstruction is talking about. It's not talking about destruction or utter chaos or randomness or things ridiculous. Therefore, according to Derrida, texts have gaps texts have aberrations and texts have inconsistencies which is the job of the deconstructionist to show reading against what he says reading against the grain of the text and he says here the reading must always aim at a certain relationship unperceived by the writer between what he commands and what he does not command of the patterns of how beautifully put of the patterns of the language that he uses. So, these gaps, aberrations and inconsistencies are what have need to be foregrounded. Actually, how the methodology goes and as a method then you take a text and you show how uh, you know you, you break it down, you show how or rather the text breaks down, uh, how the text will defeat text defeat their stated aims and purposes, rely on false or unsustainable oppositions, make use of figurative uh, terms, reverse their own arguments, depend on other texts and signs as an intertextuality, conceal arguments that are the very opposite of what they ostensibly, uh, ostensibly show. So, quickly now let us look at the just one or two questions. For instance, if you get a question like what is post structuralism's take on knowledge, that is how does post structuralism consider knowledge. The answer is this, in post structuralism knowledge is not a question of true discovery, but it is seen as interpretation and the privileging of any one interpretation of a text is seen as an act of power. Next, how does the approach to meaning in post in structuralism differ from that in post structuralism? The previous question was to do with knowledge, how does post structuralism consider knowledge, how does it look at knowledge, how does it define knowledge, right? Here it is with meaning, how does the approach to meaning differ um, you know in, in structuralism and how does it differ from that in post structuralism and the answer is that in structuralism there was a, there was a certainty of knowledge uh, in the sense that we admitted the fact that meaning is always differential in a system, meaning is relational that words or terms signs are related to other signs and the meaning of a sign emanates from its difference ok. That is why meaning is differential in, uh, in structuralism. Yet, we saw that meaning is, uh, is graspable, we can grasp meaning because the there is a stability in the structure right. There is a framework, there is a stability and it is an organization after all of science, it is not a disorganization of science and science you can you can arrive at some sort of meaning. But we saw in post structuralism that in post in the, the post structuralist approach to meaning is this that there can never be a complete meaning whether it is a sign or whether it is this uh, you know uh, a collection of signs as we find in a text right. So, meaning is endlessly deferred and remember we looked at two words and how they are collapsed to form another word called deference right to defer and to defer ok. That is meaning no, uh, no doubt and the structuralism is differential differs signs differ from other signs and that is how they get their meanings, but we have an additional uh, you know uh, additional proposition here is that meaning is always also deferred that meaning is always postponed. You can never have a full meaning from a signified the way it is put is this is in this way by Derrida that is meaning there are no pure signifieds ok or, the, or there is no transcendental signified that is it transcends all, all cultures or structures ok. They can never be a transcendental signified the sig, uh, signifiers will always have uh, you know uh, at different times and places different signifies, fixed signifieds and the fact is that all uh, these signifieds are also signifiers ok they rise to signifiers and uh, uh, the fact is that these uh, signifiers you know the text becomes then a play of signifiers right. So, uh, we then end our lecture here and um, uh, I would want you to go back 
if you have to understand post structuralism there is also a need to go back to uh, the structuralist methodology ok. You cannot understand uh, post structuralism without structuralism maybe you can say you understand you can understand structuralism if you, uh, you know without looking at post structuralism but it is not the other way around. First you have to understand as we said in the beginning of this lecture that structuralism post structuralism uh, you know takes off from structuralism ok that the post here is not just a temporal post of say post world war one etcetera ok. It is a post in the sense that it retains and admits to some of admits some of the uh, you know co premises of structuralism, but it gives a uh, eventually a radical twist to it ok transforms it uh, and critiques it ok. And the most important um, you know uh, important point linking it to structuralism I would say in my reading is the sign and the idea of differentiality ok. Uh, you know there it definitely in as in structuralism there is meaning through a differential relationship, but in post structuralism though it is retained the other part is more important that there is always a deferral of meaning because by nature uh, you know uh, language is such that there can never be any pure signifies because of the traces substitutions and echoes from other signifies. Thank you so much.